Okay, good to see you. Uh, if you're new, my name's Joel, and we have teaching from the Bible here at Emmanuel each Sunday. We're going through the Apostles' Creed. We're getting just to the very end of this uh, very early and simple, clear summary of the, the basics, um, but the profound basics of the Christian faith. And um, the Apostles' Creed um, has, kept us, has kept us busy, kept us thinking, um, uh, since September, and we, we're looking today at the penultimate part of our series. We'll, we'll finish next week, uh, God willing, with, with uh, looking at the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting, but we're looking today at forgiveness of sins. I believe in the forgiveness of sins, and so uh, in a moment I'm going to read to you from Psalm 130, one of the, the psalms, one of the hymns, the poems, the songs, there's a whole section in the Bible, like the Bible's hymn book, uh, which are expressions of the heart from people mostly praying to God, calling out to God. And uh, as such, they give us uh, a treasury of um, expressions uh, to the living God, um, helping us to engage with him. And Psalm 130, it, it deals with the theme of sin and forgiveness uh, in a fairly passionate way. So we'll read that in just a moment. Before we do that, um, I wanted to mention again the live lunch, which we are launching uh, these days. Tuesdays, 12.30 p.m. Uh, if you want to join us for your lunch break, Facebook Live, Instagram Live, and then release later on YouTube and podcast. Just half an hour of chatting through the implications of the message the previous Sunday. And so some of the things that get said uh, would deserve a bit more teasing out. You may have questions yourself. You could join us live and interact with us, bring some of the questions that you've been puzzled by or uh, stimulated to by the message. Just a chance for us to go a little further, a bit deeper, and to use some of the lunch break time that you might have just to focus back on God and what he's been saying to you. Uh, so just to make you aware of that, that's 12.30 Tuesdays. Looking forward to meeting with many of you on that. So let's read from the Psalms. Uh, biggest book in the Bible, middle of the Bible, can't miss it. And 130, it says this. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchman for the morning more than watchmen for the morning. <coughs> o Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him there is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's just pray quickly. Father, we thank you for your kindness in giving us scriptures that uh, teach our hearts that draw our attention to you and your ways and refresh our souls, giving us hope, giving us good reason for peace and joy. And we pray that you'd send your Holy Spirit now so that as we look at these words and their implications that we would see in them the, the work that you've done through your son, Jesus Christ, and would find a resting place and uh, Lord, a new place from which to live out this life of being forgiven and learning forgiveness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So when the creed talks about forgiveness of sins, uh, it's using a word that we uh, use less today than the, the writers of the creed would have used it. Sin and sins are marginal words at best in 21st century Brighton and beyond. I guess we might, some of us, be used to using the word sin in the context of uh, failure with our diet programs um, and such things. I've, I've noticed recently <coughs> when I tried to uh, text my, uh, messages regarding the subject of this, this talk, forgiveness of sins, 
my phone, with all its extraordinary capacities for predictive text, did not put up the word sin. Uh, when I put forgiveness of, S, I, it gave me all kinds of options, but not sin. Uh, the options included Simon, forgive, <laughs> forgiveness of Simon, uh, which is obviously a very important issue to my phone. Um, I have various Simons in my life that, that, uh, that obviously need forgiveness all the time, but sin was not, was not in there as a, a likely option. And I, I think that the technology might be a mirror to the culture. Uh, we're not that interested in the word sin. It sounds archaic. It sounds medieval. It sounds religious, to be sure. But make no mistake, we are very alive to moral outrage. <coughs> we, we, we know about sin if we call it by another name. Uh, we know about ethics. We know about justice. We, we, we care about these things. Maybe sometimes we like to give the impression that we care in our virtue signaling on, on social media. But to be sure, we're, we're very, very alive to moral issues, whether they're public concerns that, that, that pr provoke outrage or whether they're things that have been much more personal, maybe even private things done to us that we, we feel the offense of, we feel the injury and we feel hurt and we, we feel perhaps bitter and perhaps throughout our lives um, wounded, uh, even crippled by the, the, the moral failure that has affected our lives. Morality touches life and we know it does. And in that respect, we are quite distinct as human beings. We are particularly alive to right and wrong in a way that makes us different Certainly different than the rest of creation, certainly different to the, the animal kingdom. However much you might uh, see outrage in the animal kingdom, even anger, <laughs> uh, the kind of anger you see is not, is not provoked by a kind of strong moral grid, strong awareness of right and wrong. We sometimes talk about angry bees. You know, if you poke a beehive, you make them angry. But those bees are not angry because of Amazon tax avoidance. Uh, they're, not, they're not stirred up by sort of big ethical issues in the media. Uh, they're angry for very biological reasons. If you see an angry bull in a field, it's angry because you're there. It's not thinking of, of, of issues of, of government and politics or issues of the economy. And, and yet we as human beings, we're alert to things that might be happening in a completely different country, completely different situation, but they stir and provoke a sense of right and wrong. And so we're very alive to this, and we're certainly very alive when it affects us personally as well. And we're very alive to our own record. In our most honest times, maybe in our secret times, we, we, we do reflect on how well or how badly we're doing morally. <coughs> we, we know things about ourselves that we wouldn't want anybody else to know. Maybe we wish we didn't know. And uh, we are judging ourselves kind of constantly. Maybe just on a very kind of you know, low-grade level. We've just got this background noise, this kind of humming noise in our head of, I haven't done well, I haven't done well. That can just be the accompanying sound, the, the soundtrack to, to our consciousness. We just feel, I, I'm a bit of a mess. I'm, I'm a bit of a mess. I tend to hear that kind of phrase a lot, probably a bit less often uh, than I hear, I did a bad thing. Uh, we, we, as a generation, are probably a little bit more likely to talk in generic terms. You know, I'm not, I'm just a bit of a mess. I'm a bit messed up. That's our language. I'm a bit broken. More than, I have done this very bad specific thing. Having said that, I don't mean that we're not aware of skeletons in our closet and we, we don't have that concept. We, we still do. We still, if, again, if we're honest, probably most, if not all of us, can think of some specifics. For some of us, this is a defining feature of our life. There's something that we did at a, an early stage, maybe as a child even, 
a teenager or, or, or in our 20s, whenever there's something or some things or a, a set of deeds or a, a, a season we got into and a, a way of life we adopted for a stretch or behavior, maybe things that we're still involved with right now that we know were, are, continue to be wrong. And this is no small thing to us. We might, for, for whatever reason, successfully lock it in the cupboard lock it in the closet, but it lingers and it, it spreads its, its kind of awkward feelings into our lives. So these are things that whether we <coughs> are into the word sin or not, we definitely have on our, our radar. We, 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 we just have to deal with them. And to understand where they're coming from and why we have them surely would help. Surely it would help to diagnose it. Say, what, what is this about? How can, if I, if I have a physical ailment, then, then part of the, the, the process of, of remedy is to, is to get diagnosis, is to try and understand it. A, do, a good doctor will start, first of all, by diagnosing, trying to understand what is the issue. Let's look, let's look further. Let's understand what's causing this. Let's understand the, the depths of it. Jesus if we see him as a doctor, and you may be yourself unsure about Jesus, or you may have followed Jesus for, for decades, but let's say you're, you're getting, getting used to him for the first time. Maybe you're new to the Christian faith, and, and understanding Jesus is going to involve understanding how he sees you, how he, how he sees you and your problems and challenges, your life, your past, your potential, your destiny. How does he see this issue of right and wrong? How does he see this issue of sin that we're talking about? Well, he, he understands sin in a way more profound, you could say sophisticated, definitely a more kind of textured, layered way than we tend to see sin. We're quite simplistic. We talk about sins, even in the creed, the forgiveness of sins. <coughs> Excuse me, that's the word that the... The creed just happens to have settled on. It could have used, I suppose, various words. Sin is a little bit of a catch-all word. It, in the Bible, there are multitudes of different words that belong in the general category, you know, transgressions, iniquities, and, and the words in the original languages are even more far-ranging. There are many ways the Bible talks about sin. The sin itself is a word that perhaps can be used as an umbrella term for the whole thing. When Jesus talks about sin, Jesus... He's talking about it in, in a fascinating, not, not necessarily a, a, a happy way, not something that's fascinating for a positive reason, but, but it shows the complexity. It shows that this is, a, this is a beast with many parts. There are layers to this. We tend, as I say just now, to talk about sins, specific acts, deeds, sins. That's the tip of the iceberg, according to Jesus. I, I like to put this in terms of seven Ds, okay? So I'll do go through them real quick because I think this helps us to get some idea of the richness of what Jesus is saying about sin. This, the first D I've already said, the deeds, the deeds of sin. The second would be desires. Sin is, is not an issue of simply uh, physical act. It's an issue of the heart. It's what is wanted. It's, it's what we... Uh, uh, seek after what we're motivated by. It's to do with our desires. And Jesus was was key uh, was clear about this in in the way he talked about specific acts, even that the deeds of sin, like murder and adultery, as far as he was concerned, those sins were committed in the heart before they were committed in the in the flesh. Those those sins were already there. If you lust after somebody who is not your spouse. He says, you're committing adultery in your heart. If you hate somebody in your heart, you're committing murder. Uh, so Jesus is making a scene. Oh, you've, got to go for, you've got to go underneath. You've got to see that there's a desire issue when it comes to sin. And that's, that's our concern. Our, our sin is actually stuff that goes right down deep into our hearts and our longings, our desires, our yearnings. The, the third thing, sin is a disease. Jesus talks about it as deeply destructive something that harms us, that, that needs to be cut out of our lives, and we need surgery on it. It's destructive in the sense that it kills. It brings death as another D. But, but just disease is the one I'm using. Diseases is, are things that infect, 
that, that uh, they, they penetrate every part of our lives in the end. Uh, diseases can shut down all of our organs. They, co- they, they cover the whole of who we are. And, and sin has had that effect on humanity. It's got into the whole system and it brings its destruction with it. See, uh, the, the next day, sin is also to do with dynasty. It's something we don't only handle on our own exclusively. We, we, the Bible, as we've been saying, as we've gone through the creed, Jesus himself would never talk about us as sheer individuals. And so sin is not the problem of sheer individuals. It's something shared. It's something inherited. It's something that's part of our human legacy. We're humans together, which sadly means we're also sinful together because that's the human, common human experience, which is why babies, precious, innocent-looking babies, lovely babies <laughs> that, that, that bring such joy and give such a sense of tenderness and sweetness and there's nothing. You just want to protect the baby from sin and the big, bad, dark world. You just think, oh, this baby is so innocent. The sad and horrible thing is that even there, sin's already got there. You, you can't really protect the baby from something inside the baby. It's there from conception, it seems. It's something inherited. It's something in the dynasty of man. And, and then a few more Ds. We're talking about dominion. Sin has dominion. It's powerful. There's an authority involved. There's a, it's, from the way Jesus talked about sin, Jesus talked about personality evil having a personality, that there's a a particular power that wants control of people, a dominion, a force, which explains for for many of us our our all-too-real experience of feeling like the things that we know are wrong, we know they're wrong. We don't even want to do them a lot of the time, but we'll, we'll often speak as those who can't win, I don't want it. I don't. I don't even like this habit. This. This. This way I've been. This. The stuff I do. But it has dominion over me. It's. It seems to dominate me. It has power over me. And some of Jesus' work in his ministry, the stuff he did involved literally dealing with evil forces, spiritual powers that we might find a bit flaky and creepy and Halloweeny. But, but, but Jesus, in reality, he understood that sin goes a, a lot deeper even than just <clears throat> our own human experience. But there's a spiritual side to it as well that brings entrapment and enslavement and control, a lack of control in our experience. And then another D, domain. Sin is actually a place we dwell. It's a, it's a realm, a kingdom, a country almost. It's a place we're in, which means that to be, to be dealt with, sin doesn't just need to be individually extinguished, wiped clean from the state. There needs to be a rescuing from the domain, a taking away, a jailbreak needs to happen. We need to be allowed to escape if we're going to deal fully with the problem of sin. And then finally, I want to touch on this the most. Sin is a delusion. Sin brings delusion. One of its characteristics is that it deludes, it deceives, it confuses. It makes the the sinner a poor judge and lack perception. It makes the sinner seemingly incapable of seeing themselves rightly, robs us of our self-awareness, makes us hopelessly blind to even our sinful condition. The worst sinner, according to Jesus, is the one who doesn't think of themselves as a sinner. That's the worst kind of, that's the most horrible impact of it, is that you can be so blind that you think you see. You can be so uh, sort of dull in your nerves in your feelings, in your sensibilities, that you have no idea that you're terribly wounded, scarred, cut up. You know, the literal um, meaning of what we call leprosy is literally that, isn't it? That, that, that nerves don't work and somebody's body can be 
deeply damaged because they don't feel the pain of impact from maybe a stone in their shoe or something that they've been carrying for ages without noticing. And so they're having huge damage done to them because their, their sensibilities have gone. And sin does that to us. It's, it creates a numbness. It's like asbestos. It's like we don't realize the heat we're in. We don't realize the, the danger. And so the, the delusion grips us. And you can see it in, in, in ways all the time, in different, you know, the, <coughs> the sheer fact that after, you know, watching, watching match of the day, you expect after, after every match for each manager to give their version of whether something was a penalty. I very rarely, never seen a manager, maybe you have, at the end of a match saying that, you know, that penalty that was against us was definitely a penalty. And my player did something dreadfully wrong. And uh, I'm a bad coach for allowing that to happen. Generally, that doesn't happen. Uh, what generally tends to happen is on each side, there's, there's, there's going to be a, a perception that kicks in that makes it obvious. It's plain to see that wasn't a penalty. Or it was. Or, or when, when the ball goes off the touchline and both players shout for the throw-in. Both players. Now, they both know who really touched it last in most cases, but that's not the point. The truth is not the point. That's, they know at that point, what matters is winning the game. And so we both claim, we both say, oh, that's mine, that's, that's, I'll throw in. And that, I'm afraid, is a pretty, I know it's a shallow, but it's a pretty helpful window onto the soul that the truth stops being the point. Yards back, miles back. But what matters is, is my survival, my, my reputation, my honor, my, my winning. So I don't even want to talk about my own sin, particularly. I, I, I'd rather not even acknowledge before God, if there is such a person, that I should be judged. If anything, he should be judged. If anything, we should ask God some questions about why he allows X, Y, and Z, and who he thinks he is. We live, I guess, particularly in the 21st century, in a context where we see ourselves almost as the, the judge on the bench, and God as the culprit in the dock. She's a, if you think about it, an extraordinary idea. Maybe, maybe that's quite unique to our culture. When I read older books, including the Bible, but not just the Bible, I do see people sometimes saying, why are people not, why are people getting away with doing bad things? There's a lot of that in the Bible, a lot of complaints like that. Why does so-and-so get away with bad things? Not so much in ancient books of people saying, how come, <laughs> how come bad things are happening to people? How come bad things are happening to people? That's in there, but it's not such a huge cry. In our day, it's the huge thing of, why does God do bad things? God does such bad things. God does terrible things. This is the, 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 the typical way we tend to see the world. But if God is, is, is who if God is God, wouldn't it not be possible that the reason the world is in the state is in, the reason our lives are in the state they're in, has a lot to do with our shortcomings and failings? And the question shouldn't be, how does God get away with this? But perhaps more, how am I getting away with this? How is it that I've got away with this? But we're so affected by sin that that's not going to be the way we tend to think, not naturally. In fact, when God shows up and gives us the laws, when God shows up and tells us what's right and wrong, the general thing we do is we, we either do the one thing or the other. We either reject it and ignore it as hopelessly irrelevant, <laughs> the law in the Bible, the Ten Commandments, you must be kidding. Who cares about that, an ancient book? Who, who cares what some weird ancient deity says I should do or should not do with my life, with my body, with my decisions, with my relationships, with my money? Who, who cares what they think? That's probably kind of Brightonian, but, but another reaction would be to co-opt that law and make it work for us. Yeah, I agree with the law, and I keep it brilliantly, which is what makes me better than everybody else. So either way, we're missing the whole point, because either way, we're trivializing it, just treating it as pretty, pretty small. The law is either there to be rejected or there to make me look good. It bolsters me up. 
but in both cases we're not we're not coming under the the cosmic authority of it we're not seeing it for what it really is and when i when i when i th- sort of think through times in the bible and in history and in my own life and in our lives here as a church many people i notice what can happen when a person perhaps has the asbestos taken off. See, we can reject the law. That's what happens. We can reject the writings. But what if God himself presences himself? What if God shows up in his perfection and holiness and shows the, shines the light on what we would otherwise think of as perfectly okay. If, if we think, well, my, my standard is okay, what if God shows his holy standard and we suddenly see it, we feel it, we know it, we're aware of it? I, I, I guess that's what happens. We sometimes call it revival. In in the history of the church, there have been times when in certain locations, certain times and places, people, whole communities have been suddenly dramatically aware of the holiness of God, just in ways that no one was expecting. It just falls on them, maybe like a a thick cloud for a a season, maybe days, weeks, months, maybe years. There's this rich, deep, profound awareness of the seriousness of sin and the holiness of God. And it's like the asbestos is taken away or the leprosy is cured and the nerve endings are restored and people see, oh wow, this is serious. Our sin is actually serious. This God is serious. It happens in in the Bible, in in the day of Pentecost, the people that called for the crucifixion of Jesus, the thousands of people who were like the second category I said earlier on. They liked the law because they thought the law made them look good. They even said, we have a law and by that law this man should be killed. They used God's law to crucify God. That's what we will do. <laughs> even with God's law, we'll use it to crucify him. And, and, and that was what they did. Their, their, their awareness of sin was so shallow, so weak. But then there came a moment, weeks later, when the Holy Spirit came down upon that city in such an extraordinary way that thousands, after the preaching, when when one of Jesus' friends, Peter, was preaching to the people, after Jesus has been crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended to, to heaven, he's preaching to the thousands in Jerusalem, and they call out, what must we do? And it says they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. That's a violent phrase. They were cut to the heart. They felt the, the, the sharpness of their predicament. They felt the danger of it. And they cried out, what must we do? And, and it says 3,000 became Christians that day. Because of a sudden awareness of the reality of sin, this is what's needed. Now, this is where this psalm comes in. Because what's needed, I, I, I would say, for any culture, society, church, city, is for people to surely be brought to an awareness of their need for God, of their need for forgiveness, essentially. The weightiness of their need, the weight of their burden, the weight of their sin. Until we see the, the problem, we won't seek a solution. No one cares about forgiveness of sins if no one cares about sin. No one cares about buying Christmas cards until Christmas is getting close, until the the reality, the need is suddenly on our doorstep. And and so when we preach about sin, it, it can fall on deaf ears, but when people start to feel the weight of it, when a culture, a community, a society starts to sense I need, I need to get right with God. Well, it's happened in history. Churches have started to suddenly flourish and grow and cultures change, families change. Men start treating women differently. Women start treating men differently. Children get treated differently. Laws get passed. Slaves get set free. Things change because we were wrong. 
We were, we were lazily carrying on as if nothing mattered, and we were wrong. We need forgiveness. And it puts societies in the right position. It turns them upside down. But let me, let me take a few things from this, this psalm to help us see how this works in the life of an individual. Because you see, if this is true, if this issue of sin and holiness is real, no wonder the psalmist cries out in verse 1, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. You see the, the desperation. Out of the depths I cry to you. And he says, O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. That's the prayer of someone who's seeing things in a new way. That's the prayer of someone who's not saying, God, how could you allow this? How could you do this? Who do you think you are? It's the prayer of someone who's saying, I'm wrong. I've been wrong. You are right. And I'm sorry. Have mercy on me. Not because I deserve it. I, I couldn't earn it. If I could earn it, it wouldn't be mercy. I call on you for mercy. And then you get to verse 3, where the person sums it up so eloquently. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? In other words, if you're the kind of God who, who basically, what you are essentially is a, is a, is a record-keeping judge. If that's all you are, who can stand? Who, who, we, there's no hope. If, if the law is the final word, who could stand? I've seen what's inside me. The stuff I've done, but even the stuff I've done is not even, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's the stuff that hasn't been done, but it's been done in here. It's that cauldron that, that Jackie talked about in her video, that, that stuff, that tar, I know about it. Who can stand before God, before the law? And, and when we see that verse, we're kind of, we're kind of wrestling with the, this big question, what kind of a God is he? Is he just the law? Because if he is just the law, who can stand? There's no hope. If we think there's hope, we're foolish. We're blind. Anybody who thinks a religion of laws is going to help anybody hasn't seen the nature of the problem, hasn't seen how deep the problem is. The law cannot help. We're stuck, completely stuck, it would seem. But then verse 4 comes in like a waterfall. But with you, there is forgiveness. With you, with you. What does that mean, with you? <laughs> in the very nature of God. With God, there is forgiveness. Not like God is the law, but he's got this kind of influencer knocking around called forgiveness, who kind of helps now and then and gets in his face and says, no, no, be nice today. No, no, forgiveness is in his nature. Forgiveness is part of who he is. Forgiveness is is the God of the Bible coming through. He's showing himself. He's saying this, this is what he's like. When, when Moses in Exodus 34 asks to see and hear and know God and know the name of God, God shows up and this is the language that's used about him. The Lord shows up and reveals himself. The Lord, the Lord, uh, uh, merciful, faithful, the Lord, uh, gracious, uh, showing mercy to thousands. This is, this is God saying, if you want to know what I'm like, well, this is me speaking to Moses and through Moses to global history. This is what I want planet Earth to know about my nature. The Lord, merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Abounding in steadfast You can't stop. Ever seen something abound? It's more than a, than a dribble or even a gush. It's a, it's a constant Niagara of outpouring. And this is God, abounding in steadfast, not ebbs and flows, not changes of mood, not, well, I don't feel so forgiving this week. But this, pro, just, this, this constant, persistent production, if you like, production line of mercy, faithfulness, grace, 
The question, surely, is how can these things coexist in this God who is so passionately holy? How can he take sin lightly? Forgiving. That's surely to take sin lightly. Haven't you been saying that's impossible? And it's a good question. John Calvin used to say, we would think a husband a very bad husband if when learning of the, the unfaithfulness of his wife, he simply took it in his stride, didn't care, just treated her the same. We, we would think not that he was loving, we would think he was indifferent. We would think he didn't love her. We would think he didn't care. And the God of the Bible is not like the God of the Bible cares, hates wickedness passionately. How does he do this? How does he love and forgive of abounding love with his hatred of sin? What's the possible way this could work out? And of course, when we ask that question, we're staring directly at the center of the Christian faith. We're staring at the cross, which we've talked about during this series on the creed. We're staring perhaps at the passage of the Bible that sums it up uh, so fully in, in Romans chapter 3. Perhaps, perhaps the most important Paragraph, you could make a case for that in the whole Bible, where this is what Paul says. Now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. How can God be both righteous, just, and at the same time, the, the justifier, the righteouser, the one who makes wicked people righteous. How can he do both? Through the cross. That's the only way. Through the giving of himself. Which is to say that forgiveness was never meant to be cheap. Forgiveness was never pain-free. It's, it's utterly, utterly abounding in its freedom, kindness. The offer is, is plentiful. So it says in, in, in Jeremiah 31, your sins, your iniquities, I will remember no more. <laughs> you want to know what it's like to be forgiven. What does it mean to be forgiven? It means that the person who forgives you chooses to forget. I choose to remember this no more. I will not call it to mind. The records are gone. Later in the book of Micah, uh, the Bible has God uh, speak. I'll, I'll read the very verse to you where he says this. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. How would you like to have your sins? Everything. Everything that would incriminate that would shame you, that would stain you, the, the tar that Jackie talked about, thrown into the depths of the sea. <laughs> Not to pollute, but to be forgotten forever and ever and ever. This is the, the promise. This is why in the, the Psalms it talks about him removing our sins as far as the east is from the west. How far away? Well, that's a pretty hard thing to measure. East to west? Seems infinite to me. God's removal of sin is utter, complete, full, final. I forgive. This is over. It's forgiven completely. Somebody used to say, God hurls our sins into the deepest lake and puts up a sign saying no fishing. God is saying, I don't even want it gone. I don't want it dragged up. I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in it. It's done. It's gone. It's complete. It never happened as far as I'm concerned. It's finished. The nature of forgiveness. And it means that we can be truly released from it. It means we can live in the freedom of it. It means we can know not just that forgiveness has been done, but even justice has been done. First John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. Why would it be righteous and just to sweep sin under the carpet? That's terrible. 
We would hate it if a judge did that. Surely, just sweep it under the rug. He's not sweeping it under the rug. He's just. Justice was done. Blood was shed. A cross at the center of, of forgiveness frees us from feeling that there's some corruption going on. There's not corruption. There's justice with forgiveness. And therefore, he says, you are feared. You are feared. You're feared. Surely, a person is feared when they won't forgive. Surely God is most frightening when it's the law. The law is what terrifies me, the standard and my failure. That's what makes me feel terrified. That's what causes people to tremble, isn't it? But there's another kind of trembling. There's what Psalm 2 talks about as rejoicing with trembling. There's a kind of fear that's happy. There's a kind of reverence Awe, wonder, fear. Yeah, it's kind of frightening because God is never more awesome than he is in his mercy. However much the law makes us tremble, the mercy and grace of God is awesome, more awesome still. We're seeing in it the very nature of our God. It will cause us to tremble. It will cause us to wonder. That's why in this book, so many times, the people that are actually brought to a place of wonder, worship, reverence, are the ones who've been come, have come through the storm, come through the darkest moment, come out the other side and been able to rejoice and rest. And know it's over. I'm, the war is over. Peace has come. I'm at home with God. I'm right with God. Oh, are you right with God? You might think, well, if, if, God, if I knew I was forgiven, I, I would just carry on being horrible. If I, if, I knew I could be, if I knew that God would deal with my sins forever and throw them into the sea and cast them from the east to the west, and wouldn't that make me a monster? Wouldn't that make me... Well, according to this book, no. With you there is forgiveness, therefore you're feared. The God of the Bible, the God who truly forgives, the God who truly deals with sin, in doing so causes the heart to rejoice, causes the heart to be drawn, attracted, Towards him, you start wanting God, loving God, fearing God, worshipping God out of genuine love (coughs) and desire for him. With you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. And so ours very simply in closing is to agree with him. Forgiveness is to be received robustly. God says, I forgive you. Fear him enough to agree with him. Fear him. If you were frightened of his law, you're frightened of (laughs) being on the wrong side of him, and then he says, I forgive you. Some people will say, Yeah, I I know God forgives me, but I don't feel very forgiven. And and I, I don't really, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't sense that I'm forgiven. Maybe we even say things like, I I I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. In the end, I have to say, who do you think you are? I have to say that to you. If God forgives you, if he has authority, line up with him. Fear him. With you, there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared. I choose to accept your your verdict. I believe you. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Do I always feel the forgiveness of sins? Not the same way. There are times in my life where I feel forgiven. There are other times where I don't feel as forgiven, but I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I choose it. I accept. I fear God. And I say, God, I trust what you say about me. I line up with you. I take your ruling, your verdict as the final word for me. And I won't, I won't undermine <laughs> your authority your statement about me. You almost need to be your own priest sometimes. You have to say, I I declare forgiven, righteous. And, And it means going on, enjoying this relationship. I'm declared righteous, and yet I will sin. I'll sin today. I'll sin tomorrow. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this, forgive us our sins, our trespasses. What? I thought you said I was forgiven. Why do I have to keep going back and asking for forgiveness? You don't come to him as a judge anymore. 
If you're a Christian, he's not your judge. Not in that way. He's your father. And so, yeah, I, I, I relate to my father like that. I might need to sometimes say, oh, I'm sorry, that was wrong. I, I, it's not that I'm under his ultimate judgment to be cast off. No, that could never happen now. Because of forgiveness, I'm brought into a relationship. He's working with me for my constant holiness, cha- you know, being changed to be more like him. I carry on enjoying his for- forgiveness, even on a daily basis. <coughs> and then finally, I forgive others. I learn to forgive others. I learn to work this out in relationship with others. And that's the nature of the church. It's no accident this one comes after, I believe, in the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of sins. Why? Because the church is a community of sinners, a community of people who need to keep forgiving each other, keep loving one another, keep emulating our God, who through pain, through the cross, has made a way for us. And for some of you, that's the application of this. Having received forgiveness, to keep learning to forgive those who've wronged us. We need God's help for that. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for the power of forgiveness, the power of it, the finality of it. And we pray that, Lord, you would help us to live fully in the good of it, to walk as free people, as forgiven people, and to learn to work this out in relationship with those we need to forgive. In Jesus' name, amen.